my factory tour, uh, I get to own a factory. I started the recording halfway through that rant, okay. so that'll be that'll be a fun intro to this, our Lord and Savior's, the 32nd episode of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And sadly, we are sad. We are sad. We There's are, a lot to be sad about. There's a lot to be sad about. There's a lot to be upset about. There's a lot of people on the internet that are eh, maybe taking things a little bit too far. But that's that is as the internet does. Yeah, it is. Um, when when bad things come up, a lot of people are going to jump to worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, this is a very important time to be clued into the goings on. Yes. As controversy often is. Before we get to that, though, uh, things have been going pretty good for us in personal life stuff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and for the Dungeon Bros ourselves. Absolutely. We've been we've been doing some Magic the Gathering streams on the TikToks. Mm-hmm. Been doing well. Still not posting nearly as much. No. We'll get there. Well, we promise you that. Yeah, we'll probably get there. Fans of the Dungeon Bros, we will not forget you. We will not forsake you. Which I, I mean... The fact that we can even say that is ludicrous in and of itself. I mean, we got added into a group chat with our friends, the Role Playing Degenerates. We're trying to schedule a trip to Gen Con. Yes. And some some group lodging, if you will, for the Gen Con. RPD on TikTok, Role Playing Degenerates. Please follow them. Yeah. But uh, we were added to this group chat, and uh, a lot of the people that are not content creators, they're just friends the in the crew of the Role Playing Degenerates, mm-hmm. if you will. The, the role players of uh, the Degenerates. Several of them were like, oh my gosh, Dungeon Bros, we love you guys. And it's like, all right, well. We're like, why? Why? We're idiots. We are, we're, I'm, we're just, we're, I'm just a guy. Yeah. yeah. Some but hey, people are just guys. But uh, uh, Gen Con tickets will go on sale this month, end of this month. Very soon. So that's exciting. Very soon. We'll be there. Please come join us. Uh, Dominary Remastered, Magic the Gathering set just released. Probably probably going to be one of the best sets of the year would be my guess i mean unless they up their game massively yeah uh we we opened a pack on yesterday two days ago several several packs we opened we opened a whole draft box uh doing a little competition um hopefully we can get that video popped out here soon so everybody can see just Eh. what cool we did thing the cool things we did we'll see we'll see for those of you on the tiktok live we do have a copy of uh dragon lance in front of us the campaign book that we'd love to be talking about right now but doesn't feel right also we haven't read it because of all of this nonsense <laughs> i will say i've read the player characters uh uh features that they've they've added and uh, some really cool ones in there yeah we like we liked the ua stuff they were doing when they were working on this uh earlier in 2022 um just we're gonna skip the dean draft uh just some upcoming releases because i feel like we want to hit on these every every time uh, Dominaria Remastered is now out for Magic the Gathering. Also for Magic the Gathering, Phyrexia All Will Be One is February 10th. March of the Machine, April 21st. For D&D, the book Keys from the Golden Vault, February 21st, as well as the D&D movie. Mm-hmm. March. The end of March. End of March. So that'll be... Other than that, the Cleric UA survey for one D&D will be closing here uh, within the next couple of days, January 20th. Yes. Yes. No No new uh, one D&D... Playtest has been released in the month of January, and I can't imagine why. Right? You know, they they forgot to uh, put out the UA for the OGL as well. I feel it, yeah. I mean, yeah, they just totally forgot that. For those of you that are unaware, we've been tap dancing, tiptoeing around this. I don't know how you're not aware. If If you are paying attention to this podcast in particular, there's no way you're not already aware of what's going on with the OGL. The OGL being the open gaming license, the original form of which allowed creators to create their own homebrew and sell it for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Uh, There's been a leak, a very massive leak of the terms for a new version of the OGL, OGL 1.1, as it is dubbed, Mm. that, uh, well, it would would take effect with one D&D and it kind of sucks. And nobody is happy about it, (laughs) except Wizards of the Coast executives. Specifically the executives, not designers or artists or people that care about the products, but the executives are happy with it. Regardless, there's a lot. There's a lot to get to. 
please be patient. Yeah. A lot of info dumping along with discussion. We got three main chunks that we want to talk about. We will just get some background information on the original open gaming license. The big leak from Linda Cadega of uh, Gizmodo and io9. And then the fallout and the aftermath and just the complete PR blunt blunder that Wizards of the Coast has had. Oh, yeah. We're going to get into all of that. Any any preface you want to add? I will say um, prior to all of this, I would imagine that a strong majority of the community was unaware of what the OGL was. Um, and I think everybody became very quickly aware of it within the past month and then more so the past week past week or two for sure it, i mean it's a it's the open gaming license doesn't really affect most people that play D D, nor really should it yeah but it has wide sweeping industry ramifications yes. which is why we're talking about it first a little bit of background the open gaming license the original version 1.0 and it has it has had some minor revisions. So the one we're talking about is version 1.0a specifically. It was origin in its original form was released in two thousand in the year two thousand, along with three point five e had some minor tweaks. It allowed third party creators to use the system reference document to publish their own content compatible with three point five. The system reference document is a massive document that basically is an all encompassing free to use wordings of the rules of Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 and the basic things you need to create characters, run a game, have monsters, com the whole thing. If you wanted to freeload, which is perfectly fine, for 5e, you can download the 400 page system reference document from Wizards of the Coast on D &D, um, on the original dnd.wizards.com for free mm -hmm. and it had basically everything you need and it's what creators use to reference certain spells and abilities and classes and all that kind of stuff for homebrew also it's the stuff on if you D, &D beyond roll 20 if you go in and you want to use the free features that's what it is that is what it is that is true uh fourth edition notably did not use the ogl and had its own specific license that uh is one of the many reasons that that edition of D, &D failed uh, the OGL allowed for many competitors to 5th edition to rise up, mainly including uh, the company Paizo, their tabletop RPG Pathfinder, as the major D&D competitor. When we're talking major D&D competitor, we're not talking like Coke and Pepsi. No. We're talking like Coke and RC Cola. Yeah. It, it, two different spheres of influence entirely. And that's not to say that Pathfinder is just cheap, discounted, kind of crappy D&D. It's a wonderful game, but it's based on the same kind of systems because of the OGL. 5e used OGL 1.1, which is one of the many reasons that it's had its meteoric success. Largely on the backs of third-party publishers such as Kobold Press, the aforementioned Paizo, Critical Role, MCDM, Dimension 20, all of these creators that created their own D&D content and shared them online that they would not have been able to without an open gaming license. If we fast forward now, we're all the way up to 1D&D. &D. At the beginning of December, there was a leak, some somewhat bad information, I would say that there was not going to be an open gaming license at all for 1D&D. &D. Wizards, after a day or two, dismissed the leak entirely and confirmed that there would be an OGL 1.1 and it will have some updated terms. The main points of their updates that they told us, because they did not release the document, what they told us was they were not going to allow NFTs to be minted using IP associated with D&D &D and Wizards of the Coast. They do not want large businesses to be abusing their IP. That is a square shot at Paizo and Pathfinder. They claim that it would not affect virtual tabletops as they all have custom contracts with Wizards of the Coast. Creations using the OGL must accept the license and report to them any commercial offerings that they have. So if you sold it on Drive-Thru RPG or the DMs Guild or something like that, you'd have to report it to Wizards of the Coast. OGL-related revenue also had to be reported to them if you made more than $50,000 revenue annually. That is different. That is gross, not net. So before you pay any expenses. You have to include a creator badge in any content that uses the OGL. And lastly, they are going to charge a royalty to creators making $750,000 in revenue or more off of OGL content. And they specified very clearly 
but that's basically 20 entities in the world <laughs> Which, again, Paizo, Kobold Press, MCD, like that's the echelon of creator we're talking. That would be mandatory royalties. That is what Wizards of the Coast told us. Yeah, so this, this, the leaker, um, what I assume, it's hard to say whether or not they actually had information or if they were just trying to stir the pot. Um, uh, because what they were referencing sounded more like, oh, there's not going to be a system reference document. Because as we will later talk about more, uh, when when the OGL was originally created 20 years ago, it was created in perpetuity. Yes. It was meant to just continue on forever. And again, when we saw 4th edition not do as well, it was because they, didn't, they tried to change over to a different one. But the OGL still existed for 3.5, and that's why they were able to go back to it for 5e. And this was, uh, uh, we were watching uh, some other creators talk about it, some bigger creators such as Matt Colville from MCDM. And he kind of gave some background into the reason they created it was, well, adventures don't make a lot, make a lot of money, but you gotta have adventures to sell people. Like that's what people were wanting back then, mm-hmm. extremely, and to to this day still yes. But you would only get you know one the dungeon master really buying that adventure. So Wizards was like, well, we want to build uh, other material and and still sell it. So why don't we let third parties create these adventures so that people will buy our products to supplement their adventures Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a great idea in theory in theory in theory it was a great idea but we get to the big leak this is the one that create the the hashtag open dnd trend was created with the original leak Mm -hmm. that was swiftly dismissed by wizards of the coast Uh, that created the hashtag open dnd trend if you were familiar with that this leak upcoming was the one that blew it up into the only thing that you see on Twitter if you follow D&D stuff, the only thing that people are talking about on TikTok, on YouTube, everywhere. Mm-hmm. This is from, as aforementioned, uh, Linda Cadega. Uh, they are a reporter for Gizmodo and on uh, io9, owned by io9. Uh, the leaked source was only quoted as an io9 source so we don't know who we don't know if they work for wizards of the coast or what Mm -hmm. but this is what they had to say they prevent they presented linda a copy of ogl 1.1 and then linda summarized the her copy of the ogl 1.1 would have preferred just showing us the document uh they claim journalistic ethics for the reasoning i work in journalism as well i don't necessarily agree with that yeah, we did actually have a little back and forth on uh, Twitter with uh, mm-hmm. Linda. We asked her. We asked them. I'm sorry. We asked them onto the podcast. Uh, we had we had some DMs with them, and uh, I'm sure they were just getting inundated with requests. Oh, I'd so imagine so. Yes. That we we never heard back, but that's totally fine. What they summarized the OGL as uh, 1.1. Is about a 9,000 word document. For context, the original OGL 1.0 was 900 words. A lot more legalese, a lot more details, a lot more rules and restrictions were added. It addressed new technologies like blockchains and NFTs, it takes a strong stance against bigoted content, reserving the right to terminate any OGL content that is, quote, blatantly racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, bigoted, or otherwise discriminatory. I think that's perfectly fine and reasonable on both counts. Yeah, we've seen a lot of that coming from Wizards this past year um, in their apologies for the Hadozi ma- uh, mess up that they did, as well as when TSR started to rear up again, mm-hmm. um, Wizards was very quick to dismiss their connection because of bigoted, uh, bigoted content that TSR was putting out. Yeah. Yeah, Wait, both of those are very reasonable, and apparently minting NFTs of D&D IP is a thing they're worried about. Well, we did see uh, in we did see in 2022, very beginning of the year, if you remember, there was a group trying to mint Magic Card NFTs. Yes, and they and yes. Wizards of the Coast was very swift to put an end to that. Oh yeah, which I again I think is perfectly fine. They're a company; they own the IP. They're more within their legal and ethical rights to do that. NFTs are kind of a scam, if we're all being honest with ourselves, as we've seen this last year. But we're not here to talk about that scam. Let's talk about a different scam. The scam. Uh, The next major thing. OGL 1.1 would deauthorize the original OGL 1.0, meaning that the OGL 1.0 
would no longer be a license that you could use going forward. When when we were originally talking about, if you remember a couple of episodes ago, about the not having an OGL leak from the beginning of December, we said, well, you could still use the original OGL to continue to make 5e content and then have that be backwards compatible with 1D&D. OGL 1.1 specifically terminates the original OGL, eliminating that option. The wording would require publishers to overhaul their products and distribution to comply with 1.1, OGL version 1.1. The wording would void any future uses of the original OGL 1.0. It only allows for the creation of role-playing games and supplements in printed media and static electronic file formats. It would not allow for anything else, including but not limited to videos, virtual tabletops or VTT campaigns, computer games, novels, apps, graphic novels, music, songs, dances, pantomimes, those were all literally listed. Mm-hmm. Apparently, we have to worry about them selling pantomimes. Yeah, online. man the 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 silent uh, uh, arts community, the silent visual arts community. Man, they were they took a big hit with the with the OGL one point one yeah. for sure. Again, it, this it kind of feels like a mixed bag because. It, it, the wording of it would retroactively deauthorize any content that was originally made with 1.0, which I'm sure was not their intent, but that's how it literally would happen. And then voiding future use of the OGL, you don't want people using the old one when you have a new one that benefits you more. Correct. From the company's perspective, I get that. From the community and creator's perspective, not so much. When it comes to content that was quote non-commercial they claim that the fan policy would continue to cover it fan content includes fan art videos podcasts like the dungeon bros podcast you can find on apple google spotify youtube microwave ovens blogs websites streaming content tattoos altars to your clerics deity etc they were playing coy they're playing but there's always some sort of that that little altar to your clerics deity some reference they've been doing that uh in all of their books absolutely. all through 5e and all through their statements absolutely um, so they're just trying to keep the thing again they don't want people not to participate and when and the way that people participate is all these different things like oh i made i made my favorite my own character or i made my favorite character and put mm. it on youtube or facebook yeah they're not going to take that they they never had any intention of taking that down absolutely one of the things that annoys me the most is that they were requesting that creators deliberately distinguish between what content is their own original content and content within the OGL, suggesting using different font colors, asterisks, or putting a separate index specifically to reference OGL-specific content. Previously, you could use OGL content within your own homebrew Mm -hmm. and simply by including the entirety of the OGL agreement in the back of your homebrew. Get 900 words. It was like two pages even. If that, if that. So now you have to actually, essentially they're saying reference or completely separate content that is pulled from the one D and D system reference documents that will be, and then content that you are creating which would make for some very ugly homebrew products. It would start to look like a scientific paper. Yeah. Because if, you, if, you if you're used to reading those, basically you read a line, there's a footnote. You go down to the bottom, and it's a reference to a certain page on a certain book that the author of the paper looked at and like, all right. And it goes, you know, I've seen, I've seen two-page essays that have 200 different reference footnotes. Yes. And in realistically... If you're making a homebrew, say you're making a fighter subclass. If you call it a fighter subclass, does the fighter have to be in a different color because it's using OGL content? Mm-hmm. If you if you have a feature that references, say, Second Wind or Action Surge, do you then have to format that differently and link out to that specifically in the SRD, even though we all know what Action Surge is and that it's not an original feature? Mm-hmm. You know? But there... It, seems very pedantic of them the next big thing for commercial content they wanted to create three different tiers of commercial content content that is for sale using the ogl the first tier is the initiate tier if you have registered at least one licensed work but have not generated fifty thousand dollars or more in total gross revenue from ogl related content 
in a given year, you are at the initiate tier. That tier, basically, you can do what you want. Be the same as today, more or less. More or less, just with more red tape exactly. and hoops to jump through. The intermediate tier. If your licensed work or works have generated more than 50000 in total revenue in a given year, but less than $750,000, you are in the intermediate tier. This is the tier where they start to pay more attention to you, mm -hmm. I feel. This is where they start going to individual creators and trying to create special contracts that go over what the open gaming license would provide in the first place. Um, obviously, Critical Role is way too big, but they have a contract. Right for D D Beyond being the sponsor of Campaign 3. And MCDM has their own contract. They don't really use the OGL. The bigger creators have that. And then the last tier, the expert tier. If your licensed works have generated more or have sorry, if your licensed works have generated at least seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in total revenue in a given year, you are at the expert tier. Expert tier creators owe a 25% royalty to Wizards of the Coast for money made after the 750,000th dollar. So if you make 750 if you make 750,000 and 1 dollars, you're not paying 25% of the entire 750,000. You're paying 25% of the first of that dollar that you made after 750,000. dollars So you'd only owe them 25 cents. Which it's very similar to the United States tax system. Yes. Where and you have tax brackets and then you don't pay a higher tax rate until you make the amount after the previous tax mm -hmm. bracket. And and at a high high level, very distant overview, like them wanting a royalty isn't an insane thing. There's plenty of other... If, a, if an artist puts... Uh, puts you know, music onto get gets their music onto a TV show or a movie, or it's just mm -hmm. on Spotify. Those are going to pay that artist a small portion. Uh, when you get into twenty five percent, when they're taking a quarter massive. of every dollar you make over seven hundred fifty thousand before you pay your bills. Yeah, that is massive. That's a huge amount. That is explicitly a chilling effect on large companies such as Paizo. They did claim that if crea creators achieve great success with the OGL content, whatever that means, they would want a more mutually beneficial custom contract to be made with them. Seemingly, this royalty is basically a fuck you, Paizo and Pathfinder. We're not going to make an agreement with you. Pay us a quarter of everything gross that you make after your first three quarters of a million. Mm -hmm. And then other companies could... M would obviously be given contracts that are more in a reasonable range of royalties, like 5%, 10%, 8%, whatever arbitrary number that might be. Yeah. We also know that uh, uh, Disney used uh, the the SRD, or the uh, OGL, apparently, in, for a video game many, mm -hmm. many years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And it's... I mean, they're probably not making too much, too much off of that... Uh, creation anymore but if another company wanted to use that in the future they would not be able to or they would owe a lot of money they would owe a lot of money especially if it achieved some amount of success one of the odd inclusions is that they listed kickstarter as what they are calling a quote preferred crowdfunding platform where campaigns will only have a 20 percent royalty unless another contract is made it's basically making kickstarter a having preferential treatment for OGL related content that's being crowdfunded mm -hmm. which, which just seems like an odd thing for them to want in the first place yeah I think this was one of the first uh, obviously the the royalties thing is a is a massive red flag for a lot of people in the community but this Kickstarter thing was kind of the uh, for I think myself was one of those the first little nuggets of Wait, what? The, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Now, this Kickstarter thing is very interesting because this is what gave the leak, in my mind, its first real credible um, support. Yes. Uh, Kickstarter's John Ritter, he's the director of games at Kickstarter, confirmed in a tweet about a day, two days after this article came out that Wizards of the Coast reached 
that Wizards of the Coast reached out to Kickstarter about the new OGL, saying that there were that there are not going to be any kickbacks or hidden benefits to Kickstarter by offering this loyalty and being their preferred partner, and that they were simply advocating for a lower percentage for users on Kickstarter. This this is where our, we were we were, as we often like to say, no need to be reactionary about most things. Mm-hmm. The internet has a tendency to overreact, and we were being very pensive about saying much about the OGL. Mm-hmm. Uh, once this tweet from the Kickstarter's director of games, that's when I started to think, oh, this leak probably has a lot more credence to it than the last one did. It is comforting to know that Kickstarter has our backs on this. They said they were trying to tell Wizards of the Coast, don't do this. Yeah, they 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 were they, he was implying that they didn't want they don't want any Watsy part of it. Do, yeah, they don't want to partake in any of this. Next, all commercial content must be reported to Wizards of the Coast through a web portal that they would create uh, that they say would exist through the D&D Beyond website. To me, that feels like an impossible task to monitor open gaming license just generally mm-hmm. with the amount of stuff that people make right. for commercial sale. I mean, we make we make homebrew. Mm-hmm. And peek behind the curtain, uh, we're not making triple digits in dollars no. <laughs> on our homebrew content. But all of our stuff that we would release would have to go through the web portal and be reported to them. And then they would have to log it and keep an eye on it. I mean, right now, uh, w- the way we do it is we go through or drive through RPG. And originally, for I think our first five maybe in, uh, instances of homebrew... Somebody reviewed it at DriveThruRPG. Uh, after that, they said, "You guys seem to know what you're doing. You don't need to. We don't need to review your stuff every time." Exactly. And and that's just that's that's just DriveThruRPG. There's also uh, there's also another D, uh, the DMs Guild, but to try and do all of that, we're assuming that they have to collect all of that and maybe get rid of those other two, you know, or. or sue them out of existence the other two websites mm. and just to make it go through D D beyond and then are they what is it going to be a bot that just scans and says uh this has a 67 percent. all right take it down and sue the creator or is this going to be they're hiring 1700 people to review every piece of Wizards, content that comes through there which is the coast is already getting too bloated as it is i mean and they're obviously never want anyone to lose their jobs but when you look at what they're doing they're creating so much more D&D content. They're creating so much more Magic the Gathering content. They're having to hire a lot more bodies, and now they're going to hire even more when analysts, as we talked about in previous episodes, Bank of America, Magic the Gathering is way overprinted. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure, it's print to order, but they're making too many products. D&D, they're re- releasing, in my mind, too many books. That That's a whole other thing. Next, we get to the Wizards of the Coast is holding power close to the chest part of this document. They have a clause where they have, quote, the right to modify or terminate the agreement for any reason whatsoever, provided they give a 30 days notice, meaning they could terminate the OGL and thus cancel any progress products that are in progress possibly deauthorizing any content that was made previously and was released under OGL 1.1 and they just have to give you a month's notice Mm -hmm. and they have no other repercussions to them whatsoever. They also reserve the right to use any content that licensees create commercial or non-commercial with legal wording to avoid infringing on copyrights from licensees about content they create using the OGL that is not actually OGL content. Wizards would have a, quote, non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose. That sounds so malicious. Yeah, that that's... Uh... The, and this is one of this is I'd say one of the uh, more major things that more people freaked out about. Even I'd say more so than the uh, the royalties. Again, that's not going to f- affect that many people. But what a lot of people understood this to mean is 
if I put anything out on the web, if anybody sees it besides me, wizards can and maybe will come in, take it and say, this is ours now, we're selling it. Yes, that is very, very dangerous. Also, the irony of them trying to deauthorize the original OGL, which had a perpetuity clause in it, only to include a perpetuity clause in this document and somehow think that it's more valid than the previous one is hilarious to me. We'll get into the legal wording of the original OGL and whether or not the content that the OGL was allowing you to use, even they have the control to give licensing mm-hmm. out to in the first place later. But the last, the last major point of the leak that I want to touch on, Wizards of the Coast was clearly expecting the OGL changes to be met with a lot of resistance. The document notes that if the company oversteps, they are aware that they, quote, will receive community pushback and bad PR, and were more than open to being convinced that we made a wrong decision. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they were hoping that nobody would read in too deeply about it, and it wouldn't cause such a massive uproar like it has that they'd be able to brush it under the rug, move on, and then a couple of weeks, months later, everyone would have forgotten it. It's all hunky-dory and fine. They were wrong. They were wrong. They were wrong. They were wrong. Now we get to the aftermath. The aftermath is where the internet lost its mind. Oh, yeah. At first, I was wondering how valid the losing of the mind was. At this point, I think very valid. Absolutely valid. Wizards has all but confirmed that the leak was accurate Mm -hmm. at the time creators and fans on every social media site were in an uproar creators who were even deeply partnered with the wizards of the coast my example here is jenny d she is a cosplayer very popular for dungeons and dragons she showed up in uh, the wizards presents event that they held in the summer also literally the face of tasha when they were advertising Tasha's Cauldron and everything. They hired her to do a Tasha's cosplay and be the face of Tasha Mm -hmm. herself. Wizards released only one statement on D&D Beyond's Twitter account a couple of days after the leak, with their other accounts remaining silent entirely on the issue. Quote, We know you have questions about the OGL, and we will be sharing more soon. Thank you for your patience. That is it. Yeah, and this is uh, this is where we saw a lot of creators. Jenny D exp- uh, was one of the first ones I saw. Had one of the top tweets replies that said, "We don't have questions. We have concerns." Yes, there aren't any. There are not questions. There are, yeah. D and D shorts was very very vocal. Um, obviously, Linda Cadega, they were very vocal on Twitter as well. The writer of the leak. That tweet in and of itself, not a problem. No. They post that tweet, and then the next day they release a statement. I think that's fine. In fact, that's responsible. That's responsible. That's what people were expecting. Many, many days, almost an entire week went by of radio silence from Wizards of the Coast while the tabletop RPG community fucking imploded on itself over this OGL leak. Mm -hmm. And they said nothing. I don't know how a company can be so negligent when clearly they're trying to do something that they know would be perceived as malicious, that in my mind is in many ways malicious, have all of this backlash to the point that they feel the need to say a tweet in the first place, send a tweet in the first place, and then they just let it fester for another week. And continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Now I I, I get it when we come when it comes to corporate, uh, corporate and legalese. Yes, you have to you have to have your lawyers draft it, and then you have to set it to the editor, and then you have to have it reviewed, and then you have to have the big bosses say it's okay. That all can be done. That can all be expedited. You know, yeah. I've seen companies where it's like, woo, we messed up. Several hours later, come out with an apology. So, a week though, we're we're. We, we what gotta wonder was uh, was the head of Wizards of the Coast just on vacation they, that week yeah, and just unreachable in the, the middle of the Sahara Desert with no cell phone? Were they were they like chilling on the on the beach, sipping a mai tai in like the Cayman Islands, like, laughing over all the money that's going to roll in? <laughs> we'll get to why the money is not rolling in <laughs> in a little bit. Yeah, but 
I, I just want to point, there was so much going on on Twitter. Oh. I, I just wrote down as many things as I possibly could for stuff that was in the aftermath. Many people were pointing out that writers for Wizards of the Coast's D&D releases have originated from third-party creators. Possibly creating a situation where they shoot them on their, themselves in the foot, removing a major pipeline for writers and designers for their future releases and future staff. For example, most of the writing staff on Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel was from third-party companies. Kobold Press produced Tyranny of Dragons, the original official D&D 5e adventure, and the people behind Kobold Press were contracted to develop the Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Two of the original 5e adventures were from Kobold Press. I will say, uh, at least for the Ghosts of Saltmarsh, very notably well-written, and, and uh, from what I understand, has a better ship system than Star... Than, um, Space one. Spell Spelljammer. Jammer. Yeah, it had. A, uh, I've heard people say that Ghost of Saltmarsh has a better ship and combat system than Spelljammer. I yeah. I mean, they even released an uh, an Arthur Arcana a long time ago about ship combat related stuff, and people thought the system in Ghost of Saltmarsh was better than that. Still, we're still waiting for a proper good official ship combat rule set. <laughs> Don't think we'll be getting that. Kobold Press, among many other companies, started announcing their own tabletop RPG systems to completely forego using the OGL entirely. Kobold Press's is codenamed Project Black Flag, confirmed it already announced D&D projects will continue to be created and will comply with the new OGL, such as the Campaign Builder, Cities and Towns, as well as Deep Magic Volume 2. Products that for D&D that they already announced, they're not going to screw over their customers by canceling them. The hashtag Open d d movement grew immensely and with an entire website, www.opendnd.games, that was a petition for people to sign if they wanted. If they wanted. They're disgust. Voice their disgust over the OGL, all that. Sign a petition, whatever. Write your congresspeople. Um, uh, call Biden himself in, yeah. in, in the White House. Get him to come down on Chris Cox. Go, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, I mean, Chris this Cox, is, for those of you who don't know, is the CEO of Hasbro. Yes, but also as an innuendo, if we want it to be. In your endo. Hey. Oh. We still have fun here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Many people were claiming that they were going to jump ship to other TTRPG systems entirely, the big one being Pathfinder. Silver lining here. People are probably going to try out a lot of new uh, tabletop RPGs. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, said for a long time now that because uh, I've seen it happen multiple multiple times where somebody goes in and says I want to do this sort of game and I'm like well that doesn't really work with D&D don't get me wrong you can try it but certain times you just want to you know if you want to play a really low power game you want to turn your head and look at something that doesn't even come close to the power level that a first level character in D&D has um, we, we've, we here at the Dungeon Bros have been big fans of promoting other ttrpg systems yes we've been we've been meaning to play pathfinder for a while yeah uh but you've been playing uh game kids on bikes Kids on bikes uh, i just also bought a, the savage worlds mm-hmm. um system so i'm gonna look into that a little bit uh, i was interested originally in the Cinderbrush system mm-hmm. there was a one shot uh for uh critical role that they did using Cinderbrush, which is like a if you were a fan of like the cw like vampire mm-hmm. werewolf high school drama shows it's kind of that vibe but yeah so there's plenty of other ones out there but so many people default to D mm-hmm. and probably just because it is and the big one the big one it's been the biggest one for several several years now yep paizo had some major announcements as well first of all paizo kobold press mcdm the, so many game companies were the memes just <laughs> me the memes the memes were great but they announced their own license, ORC or ORC, the Open RPG Creative License. Technically, it's Oracle. <laughs> Which could, that also works. They could they could have they could have made it the ORCL and called it Oracle or something like that. Yeah. Orcs fine too. We're not here to tell Paizo what to no, do. Not at all. Not at all. Or if you want to hire I mean, us, I mean, though, I'm more than welcome. I to. mean, more than welcome to. 
It's set to be a game system agnostic platform that any game company can use to allow its users to create third-party content within their own systems that will be open, perpetual, and irrevocable. It was going to be owned, it's going to be owned by the Azora Law Firm. This is the firm that Paizo use for their own IP, and it's the firm that originally helped create the open gaming license so as to be separate from any corporation's control. Gaming corporation, specifically. Several companies already announced to support Orc include Cobalt Press, Chaosium, Green Ronin, Legendary Games, Rogue Genius Games, and since then, many, many more, like, every day. Mm-hmm. Claim- they also made a very stern claim in their post, Paizo. They claimed that OGL 1.0A, the original one from 2000 that was used for 5th edition, cannot be revoked, citing that their owner, Lisa Stevens, their president, Jim Butler, who were both at the time of creation of the OGL leaders of the D&D team at Wizards of the Coast, as well as Brian Lewis of Azora Law, the attorney who created the legal framework for the original OGL, and then Ryan Dancy, a person, the person who conceived of the OGL in the first place. Their claim that the perpetual clause within the OGL means that it cannot be revoked, and so that Wizards is illegally going to breach their own contract, essentially, mm-hmm. opening up, opening them up to essentially a class action lawsuit from anybody who has created Homebrew using the original open gaming license. Their claim being OGL 1.0a cannot be deauthorized ever. And they were, they did say they were prepared to make that point in court if need be, but they would prefer not to. You know why they would prefer not to, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Because court cases are expensive. Expensive. Very expensive. And long and drawn out. And again, to go back to the Coke RC Cola comparison, who do you think has more money? Yeah. Coca Cola or RC Cola? Wizards of the Coast or Paizo? I'd imagine Wizards of the Coast, you know, the company that makes up. Half of the revenue of Hasbro yeah, has more money than Paizo. Has- Hasbro, one of the biggest toy makers in the world. Um, Paizo, interestingly, uh, in, in, in their posts about this, one of the things they pointed out was that they, they still use the OGL 1.0a. Not because their system, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, relies on it. But they did it in order to make second edition more creator friendly. Yeah. So that other people could come in and use uh, use OGL OG, OGL 1.0a to make stuff for Pathfinder. Um, the original intent of the license in the first place. Mm-hmm. And uh, now, of course, they're they're suggesting something like the Linux system, where yes. Linux is not owned by. Anyway. Any any major corporation, yeah. it's not it's not owned by Microsoft. It's not owned by Apple. It's Linux. Yeah, they also that that last point being they didn't want the law firm to continue to own it because it is the law firm that they use, and they were going to try and find a company that would own uh, the Orc license, make it basically its own entity. Almost yes, that is completely separate from the tabletop gaming industry. So something like this would never happen again. Exactly. The last thing I'll say before we move on, Chaosium, Green Ronin, Legendary Games, Rogue Genius Games, all of these game companies have all been announcing their own tabletop RPG systems, their own changes that you can do, their own new product lines. Search around, try something new. It's a great time to do that. It is a great time to do that. And here we are now, nearly a week later, where we finally get... The Wizards of the Coast official statement on D&D Beyond by, quote, D&D Beyond staff on January 13th, well over a week after this all started. They said they had three major goals. They wanted to prevent the use of D&D content from being included in hateful and discriminatory products. 
They wanted to address those attempting to use D&D in Web3 blockchain games and NFTs by making it clear that the OGL content is limited to tabletop role-playing game content like campaigns, modules, and supplements. And lastly, they wanted to ensure that the OGL is for the content creator, the homebrew, the aspiring designer, our players, and the community. No major corporations could use for their own commercial and promotional purpose. They wanted to lock down the OGL so that they wouldn't have another Pathfinder competitor. Mm -hmm. Driving those goals were two simple principles, they claim. Their job is to be good stewards of the game. The OGL exists for the benefit of the fans. Nothing about those principles has wavered for a second, supposedly. That is why our early drafts of the OGL originally included provisions that they did. The draft language was provided to content creators and publishers so their feedback could be considered before anything was finalized. In addition, to lang- in addition to language allowing us to address discriminatory and hateful content and clarifying what types of products the OGL covers, our drafts included royalty language designed to apply to large corporations attempting to use OGL content. It was never our in- intent to impact the vast majority of the community. However, it's clear from the reaction that we rolled a nat one. It, was, it has become clear that it is no longer possible to fully achieve all three goals while still staying true to our principles. So here's what we are doing. And then they begin to list what changes they are making to their draft. Already littered with bullshit. Mm. The big one being provided to content creators and publishers so their feedback could be considered before anything else was finalized. The going theory... Because Linda and Gizmodo cannot reveal their source. The going theory was that the source was someone, one of these big companies that received a copy of this OGL with the intent that they were to sign the agreement and authorize it. This was later passively confirmed by other large companies such as Paizo such as Kobold Press, MCDM, who said they received similar things and could validate it. The idea that that they are trying to present it as this is a draft that we were looking for opinions on is a complete smokescreen to the bullshit that they tried to pull. Yeah, if they had had wanted to actually get the reaction and, and feedback then guess what? They would have done that because we see them doing that in Unearthed Arcanas. Now, it's, of course, a little different being that it is a legal document and not just a creative uh, creative document. They mm-hmm. still made it very hush-hush. They tried to make it very quiet. And that's anytime somebody tries to do something very quietly, that's always a red flag. I do believe parts of this. I do believe part of this was to uh, uh, stop hateful and discriminatory products. Absolutely. Such as quashing TSR. Yes. Secondly, I do believe that they don't want people making uh, Web 3s, blockchain games, and NFTs with their product. Perfectly reasonable. That's perfectly understandable. Um, and third, and the third one is a little, the way they phrased it is questionable. They want... They are very intent on making money. Uh, Hasbro has seen the value that the nerd community, those who support D&D and Magic the Gathering in particular, can bring because a lot of us nerds have, you know, some spending money. And and we all grew up with a bunch of these products. To say that they want, to, that it was for the, that this is just all for the community and that the royalties were to just dissuade, to, to, penalize large corporations well no they just want more money if they wanted to penalize large corporations the amount of the the threshold would have been much higher yes sub one million dollars is not a large corporation that's a small llc Mm -hmm. it's as simple as that it's not like small like sole proprietor it's small like six people six people Netting, not gross or grossing, not netting, mm-hmm. $750,000 a year. Gross, they're all doing fine, but they're not making a lot of money. Hmm. The last half of their statement 
The next OGL will contain the provisions that allow us to protect and cultivate the inclusive environment we are trying to build and specify that it covers only content for tabletop RPGs. That means that other expressions, such as educational and charitable campaigns, live streams, cosplay, VTT uses, etc., will remain unaffected by any OGL update. Content already released under 1.0a will also remain unaffected. They confirm that they will not deauthorize previous products. They have not made a claim that OGL 1.0a will be will not be deauthorized, mm-hmm. which is a problem. This also says that you. This is also implying that content attempting to be made under OGL 1.0a after the release of OGL 1.1 will not be valid. The wording of this sentence is infuriating to me. What it will not contain is any royalty structure. What it will not contain is any royalty structure. That sentence, in my mind, grammatically doesn't really say much of anything Mm -hmm. what it will not include is it not is any royalty structure so will it include a royalty structure or won't say it will not include a royalty structure a definitive statement what it will not contain is any royalty structure will it contain a royalty structure because a is not any it would if they included a royalty structure the sentence would still be true that's some smarmy shit, and it's kind of unnecessary in this, with within the context of what's going on. It will also not include the license back provision that some people were afraid was a means for us to steal work. That thought never crossed our minds. Under any new OGL, you will own the content you create. We won't. Any language we put down will be crystal clear and unequivocal on that point. The license back language was intended to protect us and our partners from creators who incorrectly allege that we steal their work simply because of coincidental similarities. As we continue to invest in the game that we love and move forward in the partnerships in film, television, and digital games, that risk is simply too great to ignore. The new OGL would contain provisions to address that risk, but we will do it without a license back and without suggesting we have any rights to the content you create. Your ideas and imagination are what makes this game special, and that belongs to you. I do see the point that there was no reason that Wizards of the Coast was going to go out and start stealing people's work. Right. right. Yeah, that was, a, I think, a big concern of the community, as I saw plenty of creators, mostly uh, mostly smaller creators, um, maybe who didn't understand the wording or didn't understand the intent behind it. But I never believed, and I don't think you ever believed, that... Wizards of the Coast was going to come down and take your TikTok no. and post it on... No. They don't... And even when it comes to the homebrew that is created and posted on Drive Through RPG and the DMs Guild, that's 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 small eggs for them, you know? Absolutely. They, they don't have time, interest, whatever for that. Now, we have seen certain uh, up, uh, uproars in the past year, year and a half now. If you remember back to a little bit different, but uh, Critical Role when they did the, oh, was it uh, the one Abria Iyengar ran? Yes. Yes. There was um, Amy Carrera played a character on there. Opal. Opal. And uh, a, an individual in the, a very vocal individual in the streaming and cosplay community um, claimed uh, uh, creative work uh, theft. Um. The, it was a dubious claim at best. It was a dubious claim at best. Uh, but that being said, the community dealt with it. Themselves. Dealt with it themselves. And in this instance, it was on the side of Critical Role, Amy Carrera, the larger corporation. But that's that. If if it were to come to where Wizards of the Coast suddenly had, you know, maybe some maybe some creator went way you know way hard and made the best thing they've ever made, and suddenly it just appears on shelves of Target. Mm-hmm. Under uh, with an, with a D and D ampersand on it, then there would probably be a community backlash if this person could you know it could prove that, it could prove it. Now, I at no point would I have thought that Wizards of the Coast would intend would they plan on doing that, but the mere fact that they they would have the legal recourse to do so mm-hmm. is a problem. Yes, 
last two paragraphs and this first one has the The, most tone deaf thing in the world. A couple of last thoughts. First, we won't be able to release the new OGL today because we need to make sure we get it right, but it is coming. Second, you're going to hear people say that they won and we lost because making your voices heard forced us to change our plans. Those people will be only half right. They won and so did we. Have you heard a, a company come out with such a catty statement before? That that's that's such no, we're all winners here. We didn't do anything wrong. We're just learning and we're gonna improve it together. Which is a crock of shit. Yeah. That's that's something that an individual can claim. That is something a singular person who makes a dumb mistake because they don't know the law, because they don't know other people's rights for a company with lots of lawyers to make this claim that we're this was a you know this was a misstep this was was, a goof yeah we we, just goofed you know we're not in this together wizards of the coast you are a corporation no you lost you're you haven't lost everything not yet but you're on the fucking verge of it Mm -hmm. but you did lose don't try to frame yourself as the winner. Don't try to frame yourself as the hero when you're clearly not. And and something uh, there to add to this, we saw again the first the first leak was by a smaller creator, ten thousand followers on YouTube, mm-hmm. ten thousand subscribers. That's not huge. The next one came from uh, Linda Cadega. A, uh, f- from a, a, a news blog. A, a somewhat respectable. Yeah, that one had, okay, so we have some, we have some. Uh, journalistic integrity and, and all that. ethics and all that. Sure. Well, then we got a third, not necessarily leak, but a third statement uh, coming from a hypothetical, or coming from somebody who claimed to be working for Wizards of the Coast on the peon level, which is the level that, you know, if any of us were probably working for Wizards of the Coast, we would be on designers, marketers, people who, who go to the Give office every day. The people who make the game and want to play the game as much as we do. Yeah. Emailed some very large creators in our community, some community like, leaders. Like all of them. Like all of them. And D&D Shorts was kind of at the head of this saying, here's what I received. And it included the, the employee said that the heads of Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro... Kind of use some very dero- uh, not derogatory, but very negative terms about how they view the customers. Yeah. Um, saying that the customers are on- are the only barrier between Hasbro slash Wizards of the Coast and money. That's such a terrible way to word that. I'm going to let me read. Let me read the quote. Let me find it. Jeez, he posted the picture of the email that he got. Let me get it. Let me find it. I'm looking oh, for please. it. I'm looking for it. Hold. Hold. Everyone hold. Keep holding. Found it. Here, this is what this is what led, in my mind, to Wizards of the Coast actually being on the back pedal on the back foot here. The email read, Hi. I'm an employee at WotC, currently working on D D Beyond. And with D&D business leaders on the health of the product line. If you want, I can provide proof of this. I'm sending this message because I fear for the health of the community I love. And I know that the leaders of what the leaders of WotC are looking at. Bulleted list. They are briefly delaying the rollout of the OGL changes due to the backlash. Their decision making is based entirely on provable impact to their bottom line. Specifically, they are looking at D&D Beyond subscriptions and cancellations as it is the quickest financial data that they currently have. They are still hoping the community forgets, moves on, and they can still push this through. I have decided to reach out because at my time at Wizards of the Coast, I have never once heard management refer to customers in a positive manner. Their communication gives me the impression they see customers as obstacles between them and their money. The D&D Beyond team was first told to prepare to support the new OGL changes and online portal when they get when they got back from the holidays. And leadership doesn't take any responsibility for the pain and stress that they have caused others. Leadership's first communication to the rank and file on the OGL was 30 minutes on January 11th, 2023. 
This was the first time they even tried to communicate the intentions about the OGL to employees. And even in this meeting, they blamed the community for overreacting. I will repeat, the main thing this leadership is looking at is D&D Beyond subscription cancellations. Hope your day goes well. P.S. I will be copying and pasting this message to other community leaders. D&D Shorts then claimed that in a follow-up email, he was able to verify the proof that this person was who they claimed they were. This then led to the collapse of the D&D Beyond website. <laughs> yeah, so many people went out and started canceling their subscriptions that either A, it overloaded the servers and caused them to crash, or B, the D&D Beyond team was told, take it down. Yeah. So we don't know which it is. I would like to think it's the, it's the primary. I, I, would like to, I would like to think that it crashed because there were too many people doing it. Because that's hilarious. That's hilarious. And that also is a little bit less malicious intent than shut it down. Yes. Either way, I don't think it's working as of the time of recording on January 16th. I might be wrong. I don't know. I don't know either. But the last part of the Wizards of the Coast statement, we had a little, we had a little sidebar. Oh, a, very, a very good sidebar. People unsubscribing from Dean to Beyond. In on, mass. In mass. And then crashing the <laughs> subscription management portal is hilarious. Their last, their last little paragraph. Our plan was always to solicit the input of the community before any update to the OGL. That is a lie. As we mentioned that, previously, that lie. trying to get companies to sign it first, they weren't soliciting anything. If they wanted to, they would have released it for the community like they've been doing with the one D&D playtest. The drafts you've seen were attempting to do just that. Full of shit. We want to always delight fans and create experiences together that everyone loves. We realize we did not do that this time, and we are sorry for that. Our goal was to get exactly the type of feedback on which provisions worked and which did not, which we ultimately got from you. Backpedaling, we both won. Yeah. Any changes this major could only have been done well if we were willing to take that feedback, no matter how it was provided. So we are. Thank you for caring enough to let us know what works and what doesn't, what you need and what scares you. Without knowing that, we can't do our part to make the new OGL match our principles. Finally, we'd appreciate the chance to make this right. We love D&D's devoted players and the creators who take them on so many incredible adventures. We won't let you down. And that is the entirety of the Wizards of the Coast statement. No timetable on when an OGL will be released. Not actually releasing a copy of an updated OGL that they are supposedly working on. And we'll see if they actually attempt to solicit any requests from the community, mm -hmm. any opinions from the community, a la a playtest for one D&D. Right. If, if, when, if when Linda leaked this OGL, there, there was originally supposed to be something, I think, on the 7th of January. Maybe the 10th. I don't remember. I don't know. The original article was, was posted on the 5th. Sometime in the days following that, there was supposedly a plan for them to announce the new OGL and show it. Ah, yes. If, that, if, they, continue, if they chose to go through with that and listed it like a 1 D&D playtest with a survey and requests for opinions, the situation would have been so much less worse. It would have been a very different situation. So much less worse. That's terrible grammar. Yeah. It, it would really have been is. not nearly as bad. <laughs> there we go. They could have, the PR team at Wizards could have mitigated this with some work, but nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, most all of the goodwill for people that are aware of this, people are aware of this, by the way, that barely play D&D. Mm -hmm. That want to just show up and play with their friends. They're the, they're people like that that are showing up to their play groups and being like, so what's up with this OGL thing? What is that? Yeah. We've seen, we've seen large creators uh, like the legal Eagle um, doesn't usually do super nerdy D and, and things related to this even made a video on this. That's how, that's how striking this, mm. con this situation has been. Which, since you bring up the Legal Eagle, we did say we were going to talk about whether or not the OGL originally 
even had any legal binding to license the things that it was licensing in the first place. Before we start, we will say we are not lawyers, and we have we we've got this information secondhand, and we're going to <laughs> convey it as well as we understand it. If if you want more of this, go to the Legal Eagle on YouTube. Uh, their most current video as of recording this is about the D&D OGL. Uh, Matt Colville ha- does an interview in it and offers some insight as well. Highly recommend. So to paraphrase the video, he, lo- he loves apparently talking about copyright versus trademark. Mm-hmm. Trademark, of course, being specific names, logos, identifiers. The D&D ampersand is trademarked. Dungeons and Dragons is trademarked. Wizards of the Coast is trademarked. The style that D and D books have, where you have like the 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 black and red like cut stripe on the bottom that says a D and D product, and like a lot of the formatting can be trademarked. Systems and processes cannot be trademarked, mm-hmm. meaning game rules and mechanics cannot be trademarked or copywritten. Now. A board game, he used the example of Monopoly, the actual Monopoly board can be trademarked as is a depiction of a board of Monopoly and is thus considered technically art Mm -hmm. and can be trademarked. For example, the rules manual of Monopoly, the specific wording and language and printing and formatting of that can be copywritten, but the rules of Monopoly cannot much like how Words with Friends, as he said, is basically exactly the same as Scrabble because you cannot copyright processes and methodology. You can't copyright putting tiles on the board and spelling letters. Mm-hmm. Spelling words with letters. That's more accurate. <laughs> and that's also how we can see how every small town in America has their Springfieldopoly, Cincinnatiopoly. Yes. That Wizard or uh, Hasbro, owners of Monopoly, is not making an Opoly. A dog opoly. They're not the ones making cat opoly. Yes. Yes. You cannot use the Monopoly name as that is trademarked. Mm -hmm. With reference to Wizards of the Coast, there are some that argue that for most content that is made under the OGL, for example, we've made many subclasses on our drive-thru RPG. You can find the link to them in the bio. They're all pay what you want. Mm Mm-hmm. Except for the stuff that's in the Blood Magic Hemocraft supplement that's four ninety nine, you can get a discount if you join our Discord server and you look at the announcements tab. For example, our we'll say the Marrow Knight, mm-hmm. the fighter subclass that we made not too long ago. We don't reference any features. We don't reference D and D. It's arguable that we don't need the OGL at all, yeah. as we are simply complying with the rule set provided and the mechanics and the names of mechanics provided within Dungeons and Dragons. It uses hit dice. Hit dice is not copywritten. Hit dice cannot be trademarked. Now, the D20 system, the name, the D20 system, that is the name of the system that is Dungeons and Dragons, is copywritten or trademarked. It's trademarked. Even where we're not legal, we're not legal. But that being <laughs> said, lawyers. they can't trademark rolling a d20 exactly they can't copyright rolling d20 and d20 at all at all can't copyright shapes so arguably the only thing that the ogl covers are the specific language and formatting of the srd document itself so technically Instead of action surge, if you called it an additional action feature and you reworded the action surge feature, that would not be infringing on any copyright or any trademark and would not require the OGL. This also implies that most products, most homebrew, because they are not copying, for example, a skeleton stat block or copy pasting the champion fighter subclass, or any of that from the SRD would not require the OGL. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything that we've made theoretically does not require the OGL to be, to be legally compliant. It would even Pathfinder 2E especially doesn't require the OGL at all. They simply included it so that it would be 
that other people could create the, using the OGL as a framework for Pathfinder. This really all goes back to when it was originally made 20 years ago and, uh, with the release of, pa- of, of D&D 3.5. It, it was a very unique situation in where the company wanted other people to make products for them so they could focus on other things. No other company really does that outside of the the tabletop community more at large. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no you can't there's no open gaming license for Apex Legends. You can't yeah. go out and create your yeah. own Apex Legends skin and sell it. Now sure, you mm-hmm. can go make a mod mm-hmm. that you can play that you can download on Steam. But you can't sell that. Can't. I mean, you technically could, but you could face legal ramifications. Ex- well, yes, that that would be struck down very fast. Um. The last the last little bit that the legal eagle talked about was there was a lot of concern that what what effect does this, does this have on streamed live play games like Critical Role, Dimension Twenty, any millions of others that mm-hmm. exist, thousands. It's probably not millions of D&D streams. That'd be a lot. He compared it to the legal framework behind video game streaming on Twitch. A very gray area. Is it the... The game... A, a video game itself is copyright is copywritten, is trademarked. It cannot be reproduced, duplicated, and sold. The story of the game, the same. The mechanics of the game can't be copywritten, as we discussed. But a person playing the game, their run-through of a game, there is really not any legal framework for whether or not that is allowed. In the video game industry, with Twitch and streamers, they see it as a mutually beneficial thing, for the most part. There Mm -hmm. have been some games that have tried to stop that. Yeah. But it is a mutually beneficial agreement, so they just allow it. And since nobody is suing anybody, there's no reason for a law. And that is the only kind of framework that exists for whether or not you running your own version of Curse of Strahd would require an OGL to be legally compliant. If the OGL didn't exist, would you be legally allowed to do that? It's a gray area. We don't know. It would have to. It would come down to does your version Add to the content enough that it is yeah. now your own work. Yeah. Are your own characters and your interactions transformative enough? Because, for example, Curse of Strahd is designed to have a party of adventurers that are amorphous and can be different and not fit into any framework, partaking in the events of the adventure. Mm-hmm. With that... I feel like we've hit all of the major points. Have we missed anything, Sam? I think that's I think up to this point, up to today, January sixteenth, twenty twenty three, that is as much as we know. Now to be fair, there might be some things that we are missing. I've been fucking burnt out on all of this. I think I typed up most of the stuff on the thirteenth or fourteenth. Yeah. We're recording on the sixteenth. I'm sure there's been more developments. I saw D and D shorts. He's been having more correspondence with the Wizards of the Coast employee and all of that. Um, some more leaks. Turns out the his his claim his pin tweet right now from January fourteenth new leak turns out the reason why Wizards Wizards response are tone responses are tone deaf and insulting to the community at Wizards of the Coast internal blah, blah, blah. people are afraid of speaking out because they fear losing their jobs. What that's that's the claim from this leak. We don't know for sure. The, we're, I'm tired of keeping up with it already. You know, if I'm being completely honest with you. I bet if you put if you spoke out and got fired, you could put that on your resume and then um, you know go over to be like, by "Hey, Paizo, hey, hey, Cobalt Press, you want to um, you want somebody who's uh, vocal?" Yeah. Also, it it have to be codified in your employment contract that you are not allowed to do that. And if it is not codified in your employment contract that you are not allowed to do that, and then you are terminated because of it, you might have some legal recourse, which they might just be strong arming as a corporation to try and get people to fear losing their job enough to not. Not that do I'm, it. not yeah. that we're legalese of any sort, but not it could all. also come down to the the, the, the employment laws in in Por- yeah. in Oregon, which we don't know. So. Um, 
you know, some final thoughts on this. If are we ready to jump to final thoughts, I'm ready to jump to final thoughts. Yeah. So this is not the first time we've seen a a nerd community lash out against some very uh, uh, poor showings from their from their the source company. That, yeah. Um. In in this case, of course, our us against Wizards of the Coast. A few months ago, we saw the Magic community also lash out against Wizards of the Coast for poor marketing. Magic, Very less bad. Very Magic less. Magic thirtieth overprinting the whole lot. But then a year ago, uh, apparently Work Game Workshop had the Warhammer community lash out against them, mm-hmm. and same with Nintendo when they tried to, as we mentioned earlier, la- or tried to crack down on streaming because. Apparently, technically, they have some rules and regulations about streaming Smash tournaments. Yep. And they got a whole community backlash. Um, so, you know, this is not the first time we've seen this come through. But... It won't be the last. It won't be the last. Uh, but before things get better, things may get worse. I highly suspect they will. I highly suspect they will. Once... Once Wizards of the Coast releases OGL 1.1 for us to see in mm-hmm. its entirety, in its proper legalese, all 9,000 some odd words of it, it's over 9,000. It's over 9,000. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And that really, really sucks. Because in many ways, I feel like D&D was getting a lot of momentum. Mm-hmm. I, people, for all, the, for all the problems and opinions about one D&D, it was looking promising. Um, the D and D movie was going to be out soon. Uh, they, the, the last few products, the swan songs for five E looked like they were going to be interesting. And now everything just has this, this gray filter over it. This like numb, like I, you can't, I'm not, I'm not excited for the D and D movie. No, not, I'm not, I'm, I would like to see the next one, one D and D homebrew or one D and D play test, but Every, every, that, whatever next survey they release is going to just be filled with, all right, what do you want to write? And it's going to be a bunch of, don't create OGL 1.1. And now Jeremy Crawford's going to have to fucking deal with that. You know? Like, it, it's unfortunate. What, what we know about the full extent of the history of TSR, who, or, you know, and Gary Gygax, who originally created the game, all the way up through Wizards of the Coast today we've seen a lot of of things that have this is not necessarily out of out of trend for somebody that becomes that comes becomes part of a large corporation and uh if we're looking for people who actually care if we're looking for companies who care about their uh about their customers and don't see them just as a barrier to their money yeah well now they're all getting revealed in in cobalt press in paizo in MCDM and all of these that are that are saying, "Hey, we're here for you." Hmm. Um, oh, oh my gosh, we never even touched on all the Patreon possible ramifications that. May oh or may yeah, not, because it's like, is that com- is that a commercial use? Are people subscribing to your Patreon because you offer them homebrew, or you, or is that just one of the perks that they can get because they support your YouTube content or your podcast or what the fuck ever? That is such a massive gray area that we, I completely, we completely forgot to that that one i don't even want to begin to get into because that has no clear path whatsoever but it if you have a dnd beyond subscription and you don't like this the best way to impact them is to unsubscribe stop giving them money stop giving them money uh i i suspect that we will still go to see the dnd movie and have a review podcast for that uh, we we've already bought the Dragonlance book. Um, next podcast we might talk about that. Who knows? Um, beyond that, I'm not super jazzed to buy any D and D books. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them end up getting canceled. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll continue to talk about one D and D. D and D for us is what got us into this gaming, into this hobby, and it really sucks. Yeah, that this happened. Um, is the answer to jump ship with D and D entirely and 
play Pathfinder and play Kids on Bikes, play Call of Cthulhu, play whatever, Vampire the Masquerade, any other system, that's a decision that you and your table has to make. Um, we've built we've built what we've been doing off the back of D anD. d And I think that's a that's a, a discussion that we are going to have to have and think about ourselves. If, as as of right now, I don't have any intentions to stop playing D anD. d five e. I think our content may evolve as the situation as we as we come to see what this all lands on yeah but again we 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 can't know what we don't know we can't know but here's the thing we can still continue to play the game of D without supporting wizards of the coast mm-hmm. and i think that the community at large can can take what we have all the physical copies out there all the knowledge that's online that maybe is not there legally maybe yeah. is not there that uh 5e.tools is a website that probably shouldn't exist and you should definitely not check out at all 5e.tools t-o-o-l-s don't check that out if you want uh it there's no free versions of any of the D &D books on that don't look at it but do continue to follow us and support us we love that we would really appreciate that yes support each other support all of all of the creators this is a tough time for everyone i mean just just in our own sphere of not in our friend our online friend group Mm -hmm. i mean the professor i've seen him they're taking it rough he's taking it rough rpd i'm sure is struggling with this uh role-playing degenerates that is typical gemini uh, Big Daddy Velvet. Sorry, Big Velvet. <laughs> <laughs> I call him Daddy. And it fell the leb. Oh my gosh! The last episode, the last episode of the podcast, we had a bonus episode with our friend Norb fell the leb on YouTube, and all of this, all of this shit broke out like right after that podcast right after. post posted. And we had plans to have him on, and we were going to talk about the next one D and D playtest, and it was going to be really exciting and. Um, he released, a he released a video like right, like the day before the major leak about the OGL is probably going, like, it's going to exist. It's fine. We, we need to have a level head and acknowledge that we don't know what we don't know instead of stirring everything into a frenzy as we are very anti-reactionary as well. And the timing of that video just, I mean, it really sucked and he, and his follow up. I mean, He's got an animated head most of the time, and he just shot his webcam, and it's very sincere. It's a tough time. Even even creators that are big that you may or may not enjoy their content, uh, the Dungeon Dudes, uh, D&D Shorts. I know some people are very divisive about for his style. I mean, it's it's tough on everyone right now. Support your creators. Um, support Homebrew. Homebrew your own shit. Play with what you got. If you want to buy a new product, uh, find it used at a at a bookstore. Mm-hmm. That's what I would suggest. Uh, if you do want to, can- if you have a D and D Beyond subscription and you are going to cancel it, uh, you can download your character sheets to a PDF. So do that before you do it, so you don't lose any of your characters. Um. We were going to solicit questions from the Discord. Uh, we, I mean, we were yeah, it's, I honestly don't want to answer a lot of questions because it's, it's just makes things more sad. We've had plenty of discussions in the discord general channel about, um, about all this OGL stuff. You can join our discord for free link in the link tree in the bio. You can follow us on TikTok. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. We've got, uh, I'm, I'm working on a critical role book review, some third party content. Yeah that you can do and uh i may have made the claim that my favorite of the books is the official D uh explorer's guide to wild mount and it is my favorite book i don't necessarily say you should go buy it at this point but again you can you can play and support D D without supporting wizards of the coast yeah uh so we're working on that video we also shot over the weekend uh some content for uh we did an entire booster box or draft box of dominary remastered the newest magic the gathering set uh crazy polls we won't we won't spoil the specific polls here if you're watching live you'll know 
And if you watch us live, generally, we've been doing a lot of uh, Magic the Gathering streams on TikTok as well. Uh, last, we have a, we have an Amazon affiliate store as well. Yeah, we do. A lot of, a lot of <laughs> I think we need to make a list of, uh, so you want to play something that's not D&D. Yeah. I think we need to do that. That's the best way to support us, um, at least monetarily, that and the drive-thru RPG with our own homebrew because uh, suck it, wizards. We're going to keep making money, even though it's not a lot. <laughs> To freely support us, like, share, and subscribe to all these different things. Yes, and we didn't solicit anything from the Discord, but as we always like to end the episode with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas, let's see what the TikTok live chat had to say. Let's see what we got. Scrolling through. Uh, our friend Miss uh, a friend from from our from our lives and uh, mystery sniper says I'm going to be leaving in a bit, but I'm going to listen to the podcast until they yell at me at work. <laughs> kind Mara says I still buy RC Cola. LOL. La- <laughs> that that was I feel like that's a really good metaphor. It's a good it's a really good metaphor. Honestly, it's a quality metaphor. We've had some some uh, agreements with the fact that uh, the letter that uh, that. Uh, they put out on D&D Beyond was full of crap. Oh, th- some they they tried to give the ultimate PR spin lying through the teeth with a smile political comment ever. I'm getting a phone. I'm getting a, a, phone, fo- I'm getting a phone call. I'll look through this while you get that phone call. Sorry. My my phone is the phone we use for the TikTok lives. I was receiving a very important call from a good friend of mine, uh, Spam Risk. Mm. Spam Risk always calls at uh, <sighs> at the worst possible times. Right. Uh, oh, uh, Scyther pops in and asks, uh, "What do you got? What are your guys' thoughts on the idea some people have that this leak was done on purpose?" That they purposefully leaked the OGL 1.1 specifically to gauge community reaction. Now, that's it. That's interesting. That is something that is known to happen in the video game industry is that they'll leak trailers, they'll leak titles, all this kind of stuff to gauge the community reaction Mm -hmm. in the early stages. Um, Given how, how much evidence there is that they're dismissive of the community's opinions that they that their own internal memos and meetings were stating that they thought that it would blow over in a month or so and they'd be able to push through anyway. I don't think they leaked this on purpose. I think they knew exactly what they were doing mm. and exactly what they were trying to do. And only because of the massive amount of backlash did they backpedal a little bit. And now with all the D&D Beyond uh unsubscriptions that have been happening I, now they're definitely going to be on the back foot this was this was i i would be shocked if it turns out that wizards purposefully leaked this yeah i would i i would be bound to agree with that we've seen them we've seen leaks for uh for you know game products we we've, we've seen a lot of leaks for phyrexia all will be one yeah. uh, upcoming magic and uh, so <laughs> And obviously they have spoiler season where they officially leak things, but there's also unofficial leaks that turn out to be true very often for Magic the Gathering, and I'm sure that's to drum up excitement for it as well. I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of stuff was purposely leaked. Um, Michael Kurt says, I just started to try out Pathfinder. It's different, but it's cool. Yeah, Pathfinder originally was a just a very homebrewed version of D&D 3.5, yep. um, which focused a lot more on... Just having so many stats you could affect. Um, if you're one of those like hyper JRPG gamers that loves min maxing your stats for your entire party in like a turn based RPG, Pathfinder and 3.5 are your shit. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Papa Sora says hashtag lower the pl- price of Mana Crypt. LMAO. <laughs> Fun fact: Dominaria Remastered has a lot of very very good cards that are getting reprinted for the first time in a while and the the packs are very inexpensive they the msrp i will say was very inexpensive a lot of local game stores and such and other marketplaces are marking them up because they're very pop they're very popular product 
uh, but eventually the the price on that will cool down. So Dominaria Remastered help would help. They, they probably will never reprint Mana Crypt, but eh. we'll see. We'll see. They tried to sell us thousand dollar proxies, so <laughs> anything's on the table at this point. They could have <laughs> they could have marked that so much different and had not had the backlash if they just yep. called it some dumb luxury product or something like yeah. that or like collector. Yeah. But no, instead yeah. they they did what they did. Yeah. That was yeah. a PR nightmare. Dominary Remastered could have been their 30th anniversary celebration. Oh, release. absolutely. And it would have been and people would have fucking loved it. So, uh Scyther says I love the legal eagle in their video on it. He also says bless you when you sneezed. No, oh, thank you. Now I have to include that part in the podcast. I was I was hoping I'd be able to cut that out, but now that you asked a question about it, I have to include it. Or we could be having this conversation right now, and listeners of the podcast are very confused as I did not sneeze in the final cut. Zero J says, I think the leak caused massive panic. I personally think it's not that bad. Wait for official announcement and that they love Dungeon Dudes and great creators, I, in their opinion. I like the Dungeon Dudes. They, they're very knowledgeable. They're fine. I don't like the presentary style, but... That's just personal preference. I'm, they're perfectly fine. Uh, I'm sure they're great guys. Um... Dungeons and Dragon Dungeons uh Dungeons of Drakenheim, I think, is what their is what their life play is called. That's a cool name. Drakenheim. That's a good That's name. awesome. That's a good name. They they released their own third party book. But <laughs> complete non sequitur. <laughs> um we've always been we we have been and I think we always will be fans of not being reactionary when controversial stuff like this comes up. Ultimately is it as bad as the fervor around it? Probably not. But it's not good at no. all. It is an actively negative thing that is going to create more red tape and stifle creativity in the name of Wizards of the Coast getting more money. Yeah, it's, that's what it ultimately comes down to is Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast saw how much money these their, their products have made and have the potential to make. And I mean, we have another piece of news that we didn't cover, but it, mostly the article that was about it focused on the fact that a few weeks ago in a live stream about <sighs> a, it was it was called a fireside chat, but it was mostly an investor meeting. <laughs> yeah. They said that D&D was under monetized and that they wanted to create a they wanted to get rid of the seasonal release and turn it into a recurring spending environment. Much like the all the live play game or the live service game, video games like Apex Legends and Warzone and Fortnite and all that crap that everyone kind of universally hates, and and when it what it comes down to is they are just they are trying to they are bending backwards in every manner that they can to make more money, boost their stocks, and get more investors. Yep. With all that being said. I'm tired of talking about this. All right. And, of course, if there are any other major updates, we will continue to keep you updated as it is very important that we keep talking about this. Uh, active active things you can do. Support your third-party content creators, ourselves included, Drive Through RPG in the link. You don't have to do that one. You can support the other ones more. Uh, or the free stuff. We'll or the free. Take, we, we'll also we, take the, the... Please download the free stuff. Have at it. If you're going to buy D&D stuff... Try to find it used, or at the very least, a local game shop. They've already bought it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't buy from Amazon. Don't buy direct from Wizards. Cancel your D and D Beyond subscriptions if you have one. If you so feel, if you so choose, if you so choose, uh, there is the Open D and D website. I believe it was Open D and D dot games. That is the petition that you can sign. Uh, whether or not they actually listen to any of that is. Neither here nor there. Whenever they release the next 1D&D playtest, there's a comment section that you can comment on anything you want. Uh, not really the venue for that, but I suspect people will be writing in in mass about the OGL in that. Anyway, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I'm putting that out there as a thing that people sure are going we'll, to do. I'm sure we'll see some other creators suggesting that as well. Yeah. Um, with all that being said, thank you very much. Subscribe to us. Follow us support each other 